What's up? Adam Kinziger, welcome to the podcast. And I'd yes. like to introduce you to Mary Trump. Hi, Mary, it's good to meet you. Meet Adam. Hi. Adam, meet Mary. Hi. It is a pleasure. How are you? The pleasure is all mine. I'm great. Thanks. And congratulations on the excellent book. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was fun to write it. And I'll probably never write a book again in my life. So I was going to say it was fun. <laughs> it was okay. It was okay. And it's fun to have it written. <laughs> that is the best part. Adam, your new book is called Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country. I can't think of a book that is needed more than this right now, given the state of affairs. But let me start by asking you a pretty boring question. Why? Why did you want to write this book? You know, it's funny because somebody, I don't even remember who it was, told me, uh, what is it? They said, like, writing a book is an inherently kind of like arrogant feeling experience because I'm like, and I struggle with that. Like, who would want to read? Like, why would I put any of my details? But the reason I ended up doing it is I realized that my story tells the broader story. It tells the story of what's happened to the Republican Party. You know, I I talk about the things I got wrong and the things I should have seen. But I think it's important to to be able to like, yes, OK, here's my story. But here's throughout the whole thing, like what happened in some of these like really important points, because I think the only way to come back from this moment we're in this division is to recognize the problem and recognize, frankly, how we got here so we can push back against it. You know, we thought that you and Mary would be really interesting conversationalists because, as we said earlier, when I was introducing Mary to our listeners, you all actually have a lot in common. Hmm. Mary, tell Adam what you told me. Well, first of all, um, I know the experience about the the letter you received from your family, yes. and uh, obviously the circumstances were different, but I know what that feels like. And yeah. uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, but also, I just wanted to mention that my dad was a pilot, and I didn't realize until I read your book that you you also were a pilot. Um, yeah. So yeah, my dad was in the National Guard, and he taught himself to fly when he was in college actually <laughs> so he his first plane was a piper cub and then yeah. we had a cherokee for a little bit but anyway i thought uh and he was of course a professional pilot for twa in uh, 1964 so i thought that was really cool you used to fly your your single engine plane back and forth to work which is yeah. amazing everybody yeah. should be able to do that <laughs> um and and of course your experience on january 6 which i think uh goes right to the heart of what a lot of us experienced at several removes, certainly. Um, so I honestly would not have imagined that you and I would have that much in common. And also, I, I wanted to, uh, at the very beginning, also thank you for your work in uh, electing pro-democracy candidates. I have a PAC that has exactly the same mission. Uh, so it's it's fascinating, and I've admired your stance for a long time now. So it's always nice when there's a little more context. You know, and also I want to say thank you to you because you've spoken out, and uh, you probably take an extra level of of vitriol that even I don't, and uh, I appreciate that. And and yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned the the family letter. Here's the crazy thing. So I would go see my folks probably I don't know once a month, right? Drive down. They lived a couple hours south of me. And uh, I happened to show up on a day this letter showed up to their house addressed to me. It's like I was there when the mailman came and uh, I'm like, all right, this is, you know, in politics, you sometimes get weird letters that are cert that are sent certified. And but I saw the the return names and I'm like, there's like, I think, 10 or 12 of them on it. And I was like, oh, well, that's family. This has got to be wonderful. So I opened this up and the first two words were, oh, my and I remember thinking, oh, they're going to say, oh, my, how proud we are of what you've done. And it says, what a disappointment you are to us and to God. And I remember just kind of like, kind of blinking and like, wait, did it, what? And I read this whole thing. And I mean, it just, you can find the the letter out there. Just, you know, I, I'm I, in, in the fact, devil. I don't mean to interrupt, but I mean, this letter is unbelievable, Adam. It's stunning. I mean, it's when stunning. you read the whole thing. It is so intense. Can I read a, f a few lines? Yeah. I'm just going to start from the beginning. Okay. Adam, oh my, what a disappointment you are to us and to God. We were once so proud of your accomplishments. Instead, you go against your Christian principles and join the devil's army. 
Democrats and the fake news media. How do you call yourself a Christian when you join the devil's army believing in abortion? We thought you were smart enough to see how the left is brainwashing so many so-called good people, including yourself and many other GOP members. You have even fallen for their socialism ideals. So, so sad. Just let me read a couple of more lines. President Trump is not perfect, but neither are you or any of us for that matter. It's not for us to judge or to be judged, but he is a Christian. If God can forgive and use King David in the Bible, he can do the same with President Trump. Franklin Graham, Robert Jeffries, Jeffries, I guess, to name a yeah. few of many pastors who mentored President Trump know that he is a believer. Obviously, you did not hear President Trump's Christmas me message to the American people. Fake news media didn't cover his message where he actually gave the plan of salvation, instructing people how to repent and ask the Savior into their heart to be born again. Anyway, it goes on and on. And it says, we are not judging you. This letter is our opinion of you. Oh, by the way, good luck in your fundraising endeavors. We are sure we know there are many other good GOP and Christian supporters that feel the same we do. Also, very disappointed with the many other GOP that have sided with the Democrats. And then as a PS, for your information, God, this person is so awful. For your information, many more family members feel the same way as we do. They just didn't ha have the courage to sign our letter or write their own letter. Not us. We are thoroughly disgusted with you. And by the way, we are calling for your removal from office. I have received numerous calls covering your actions and egregious behavior towards our president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. I mean, when you read that, were, were you surprised or did you think, well, you know, I could probably see this coming? I was actually really surprised because I... You know, I certainly most of my family doesn't agree with what I did. And, you know, my parents were good because they understood where I was coming from and they were never like hardcore MAGA people anyway. And, you know, my brother and sister. But, you know, you knew a lot of the extended family was upset, but I never would have expected that they could do anything like that. I mean, you think about the fact that, you know, Donald Trump, I think, even said once that he's never asked for forgiveness. He's never had to ask for forgiveness. And yet, they're convinced he's he's a Christian putting out the plan of salvation, which, by the way, forgiveness is the very first thing in the plan of salvation. And it just I, so, yeah, I was blown away. And it goes to show what I call the MAGA brainworms that exist and how they have infected the, these members of my family. It was incredible. When yeah, you I, read that, Mary, I mean, I, I was curious, this whole, you know, this position that Donald Trump is such a man of faith. Mary, when you heard that, I wondered what went through your mind. Well, I actually laughed, and I, Adam, I wasn't laughing at the the, the content of the letter because it's right. I can't. Um, well, actually, sorry, I can't imagine how hurtful it was. Uh, whether you were close with these people or not, they're your family, and they went public with it, and it was quite disgraceful and um, unchristian, if I could use that term. Um, but it just shows the level of delusion that's operative on the far right right now, which I'm sorry to say seems to be almost the entirety of the Republican Party, because we just saw what happened in, in the House of Representatives uh, a couple of weeks ago with the speakership uh, vote. Um, but to claim that Donald Trump, of all people, is a, and I'm sure they would call him an imperfect vessel because that's just 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 a shortcut for somebody we don't agree with at all, but he's going to ram through what we want. Um, is just so wrong on every level. I have never, and I just want to step back a second and say I don't care what Donald believes or doesn't believe. It should be irrelevant. This is the United States of America. However, the cynicism of using other people's faith in the way that he does when he himself believes in nothing. There is nobody, no entity more important in Donald Trump's universe than he is to himself. So, and I, I think, I just wanna be clear about what they were reacting. Was it the, the stance you took after 
this alleged man of God tried to overturn his own government? Is that what they objected to? Yeah, I think this came in slightly after I voted to impeach. And uh, yeah, and that was that was the government. It was January 8th, 2021. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so incredible. I don't even think by that point, I don't think I had even voted to impeach him. Then uh, that was just no. me speaking out, you know, against it. And of course, I was I was active before January 6th and calling that stuff out. And uh, but again, it's it's Christian nationalism, first off, and that has no place in government. But Christianity has been replaced by Christian nationalism. And I say it's no different. That is the kind of thing that if you were in Afghanistan and there was somebody you know, fighting against the Taliban would receive from a Taliban supporting family. And uh, there's no difference in that. And it's just, uh, you know, it, it to, so people ask me, like, how does it make you feel? I'm like, over the last 10 months, I've had to take inventory with the impact that this stuff has had. And it's cumulatively had an effect. It's just when you're in the middle of combat, you don't have PTSD until after. But I, I, I look at it, and I'm just like, how miserable their life must be to be living with that kind of anger and hate. And uh, I don't, I have no desire, I guess I, for my sake, I forgive them, but I have no desire to have any kind of a, you know, a come to like, let's, let's come to terms party. They can never talk to me again from as far as I care. Your co-pilot in Iraq also sent you a text that said, I'm ashamed to have ever served with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, if you think about the bonds of war, that's like, that's deeper than family. I mean, and for him to send that, and I just remember, I think I replied to him and I said something to, to the extent of like, what, how is it that you woke up this morning and you were so eaten up by this anger against me that you would send me this text message? And like, do you think that somehow I would have gotten it and been like, oh, you're right. I repent. No, it would just make me mad, but you had to feel like it made you feel better to send it. And so I blocked him and never talked to him again. I was going to ask what happened. And Mary, I'm curious, just before we move on to really other aspects of the book, have you ever gotten a letter like that? Have you been um, criticized either publicly or privately by members of the Trump family? And can you tell us about that experience? It, it actually wasn't uh, very dramatic in some ways. Uh, there are Trumps, so they sued me <laughs> and they continue to sue me. But like, that's our life. Our love language uh, is lawsuits. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we had been estranged for a really long time because I got disinherited, you know, and it, it's hard to show up to Christmas uh, after that has happened. And it was certainly after both of my grandparents had died there was sort of no need, but I did try to mend fences with my aunt Marianne and which is why I showed up at the white house in April of 2017, but I didn't really have any contact with them. And as you can imagine, these aren't people with whom one has deep emotional bonds, uh, which is why Adam, I just want to say really quickly, I, I, I felt such pain about your co-pilot uh, because I, I would find that much more wounding. Uh, yeah. than if my whatever my family would have to say about me. So no, I the fa my family, quite honestly, has been the least of my worries over the last few years. <laughs> Let's talk a little, Adam, about about your childhood, because it sounds like you had a wonderful upbringing um, in every sense of the word. Can you describe what it was like to be Adam Kinzinger as a little boy? Yeah, I mean, it's great, you know, looking back on it, you know, I, I now live in Texas. And uh, so I kind of like miss the Midwest. When you leave, you kind of realize what you had. And, you know, the Midwest, it's great people. I was raised with a, a great mom and dad, great brother and sister, right? Like you know, middle, middle class family. My dad ran a homeless shelter and uh, my mom's a public school teacher. And, you know, so it was that life. We we were initially in a pretty strict religious church, religious background, um, which I can talk more about. But um, yeah, I would say, you know, just just a, a great childhood. And at six years old, I started to take an interest in politics, which is weird. And uh, how did that happen? I, you know, were you watching in, Meet the Press or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the it was the 80s. And a guy was running for mayor, John Lewis of Jacksonville, Florida. We lived there for a few years. And uh, he had hot pink yard signs because it was the 80s and hot pink was a thing. And uh, I was just kind of obsessed with that fanfare of it. 
But that led to then as I got older and under, could understand more, understanding what politics was. And it just was like, I don't know, service and politics was always just something I was interested in. But I, I went through a very rebellious period in high school and college, failed out of college because I got too, too involved in my fraternity. I got a 0.08 in school one semester, which is you have to really try to get a 0.08. That's an accomplishment. <laughs> it is. It is. And uh, that allowed me then to kind of really, frankly, get kicked out of college and spend some time taking inventory. And then I got accepted back and did well. But yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting time. But uh, yeah, great childhood. And uh, I think has led to a lot of the, you know, as the church would always say, it's like, do the right thing. It's just most of them actually didn't, but it stuck with me to do the right thing. A public school teacher as a mom and a father who I know was a businessman and then ultimately ran a homeless shelter. It seems like that would be the makings of a Democrat, Adam, yeah. not a Republican. So was yeah. it your religious upbringing that that sort of imbued more conservative values? I guess so. It's, you know, my my parents were Republicans as well. And I actually, I, I would say, I would put my dad in the line of like the compassionate conservatism before it became uncool to say. And, you know, it's this idea that we we do care about the down and out and the best thing to do is to help them have a hand up and to make their life better. And so I think it was a, what I would actually consider actual conservatism and not this like angry cut mean, you know, division. Uh, it would be like a real compassion for people. And so I think that's where a lot of it came from. But certainly the religion, the religious background. I mean, you couldn't be a Democrat and be an independent fundamental Baptist. I mean, you'd be yeah, kicked out of the about, church. Tell us about your church. I don't really know much about fundamental Baptists. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, It was so it's the last type of church that still does the no drinking, no dancing, no smoking, no movies, no rock music, right? Oh, like Footloose. Like it's exactly it's Footloose. And that's who it is. And uh, so that was me. And that lasted for, I don't know, I'd say that went until probably college. Uh, I never followed a lot of those. I was drinking pretty young, <laughs> unfortunately. And I think that was part of a rebellious streak. But uh, yeah, it was just, it's one of those where you kind of are taught everything is black and white. You see this, you see this in my relative's letter, frankly, that's, that's yeah. what you're seeing. And, uh, it, but that also helped me when I started to kind of challenge what I believed and challenge the things I thought it actually helped me to open a lot more up in my life. And, and I think it's probably a good reason why I'm here and why I'm able to say like the Republican party is wrong and it's doesn't believe in anything, honestly. Uh, I think that, that process of kind of leaving that church, I consider myself now just like Protestant non-denominational and the process of leaving that church, I think has helped in a lot more ways than just that. Let's talk about Iraq because I think it was really I, th I think you're you're very honest about Mary. One thing I was struck by is Adam's very honest about his own sort of flaws and failings and his own, quite frankly, big ego. <laughs> and yeah. it seems like that ego was one of the things that motivated you to run for office after serving in Iraq. Can you explain that? Yeah. So listen, if somebody, if a politician tells you they don't have an ego, they're lying or they're not going to win. I mean, that's just <laughs> a fact. And, uh, because you have to, you you know, when I ran for Congress, I basically said to 700,000 people that of all of you, I'm the best and uh, you got to believe it. And so, you know, I was in Iraq and I, I remember, you know, coming back from that and just thinking, you know, I defended the country on the outside. I want to defend it now on the inside. Um, 32 or 30, yeah, 32 years old, thinking that, you know, people would want to elect me and put me in Congress. They ultimately did. And uh, but you you when you start tasting fame and by the way politics is the new hollywood because now you can actually become famous you can guarantee you'll become famous and you can do it easier than you can in hollywood all you got to do is tweet something astronomically crazy and the world will know your name and so when i started to get a taste for that fame when i was running i was obviously only would have been this i was only the second post 911 veteran to get into congress um, you know, I was young, a lot of attention, and that becomes addictive. And, uh, you know, you start getting on the national TV and people will text you and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm I'm known. Somebody I'm saw the me man. in the airport. Yeah, right. I'm the man. Somebody saw me in the airport and they knew who I was, you know. And uh, <laughs> but it's a reality that, look, I think Donald Trump is that he's addicted to the fame and the attention as well. And uh, I think you have to recognize that in people because that actually goes to explain, I'm probably going off into a tangent too much, but that goes to explain somebody like Matt Gates, who 
when he was a freshman came up to me and said, you do a lot of TV. I do. I want to do a lot of TV. I want to be famous. He said that to me and I'm like, this guy's going to be trouble. Well, he figured out, you know, he figured out the thing. So, but yeah, um, ego, ego plays a lot. And I'll, I'll just say also quickly on that. The one thing that I think stuck with me from the war, from that, and as part of the reason that, you know, I took the stand I did is I remember thinking, okay, if I'm going to send young people to die for the country, which I will, you know, as a member of Congress, and I'm hawkish too. So if I'm going to send people to die for this country, I have to be willing to sacrifice this job for the country. Because how can I ask an 18 year old to give up their life, which is the obviously the ultimate sacrifice, if I'm not willing to give up a $174,000 a year job with a powerful title? And that stuck with me. You know, I thought it would be like maybe some vote on social security reform or something. I didn't think it would be actually defending democracy, but that stuck with me. Is that what you think, Mary, it attracted your uncle to all of this? I mean, he was already famous. He was already, you know, nationally known. Was this just fame on steroids for him, you think? You know, I think I, I differ with with some people about this. I didn't I don't think that Donald intended to run with any level of seriousness. It, he'd yes. run before and it was always branding. Uh, and he always knew because this is one of his few legitimate skills. He always knew when where the line was and when to pull back because he could never be seen to be losing. Right. He had to take control of the narrative. And then suddenly, and I think part, part of the reason he probably didn't take it seriously is because like me and the rest of my family, we're New Yorkers and everybody in New York knows that he's a total loser. So he saw how the rest of the country or large, large pieces of the rest of the country thought about him, which was very different. And he starts winning and he starts winning primaries and he starts getting more support and worse and I think this is one of the reasons we're here now, because he's he's taught this lesson to many in, on, in the Republican Party. He started pushing the envelope and realizing he could get away with anything. Uh, so at when he realized that he was getting traction and could get the nomination, I think that it was about winning, not about being being in the person with the power and doing the job. He wanted the person with the power to wield it and uh get money because <laughs> it's always about money so adam i'm curious if the, if that's been your experience with what seems to be this incredibly swift transformation of the party that nobody feel nobody on that side of the aisle feels like they need to play by any rules anymore right. And they they keep getting rewarded for it. So. Yeah, rules are for suckers. And, right. you know, if you think about it, what you said about Trump, I think is 100 percent right, because it's probably got to be funny for you to if I just call him Trump, because you're like, I'm Trump, too. But anyway, um, <laughs> I was you know, he, <laughs> Donald <laughs> he, uh, works, too, because he hates being called <laughs> Donald by, Does he really? us, by his subordinates. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. OK, perfect. And I'll call him Donald. But he. uh <laughs> I think he he just wanted to run to be crazy and you know to to brand like you said and he accidentally got in front of a wave which yep. was GOP wanted to break the system yep. and uh, and by the way conversely I think that the country not yet but by 2028 is actually ready for a healer to come along and they won't know it until that healer basically runs and wins because you always see that in in hindsight but yeah I think look you. It used to be people that went into Congress went in for the purpose of passing legislation, right, of actually achieving things. You don't see that anymore because passing legislation, if I would run and say all the great things I did for my district, that didn't matter anymore. What mattered was how often I was on Fox News, how angry I was, how much I took on the Democrats. And uh, because it's become the new currency is not accomplishments. The new currency is fame and anger. And uh, so, yes, if you play by the rules – and if you say, like, I talk about fire, right? And, and it's one of the things I admit is we all played with fire a little bit. And some of that is the anger, the fear, the division, and every leader can do it. But you're supposed to, like, keep that fire contained and then put it out at certain times, right? But you did fall for that initially, Adam, yeah, didn't yeah. you? You talk about how you made a lot of mistakes and you kind of went down that road before you self-corrected. Yeah, and, yeah. But you were, you were one of the very few people who self-corrected. Yeah. And it's because, I mean, look, it's, 
it's I didn't play with the fire as much as other people did because I always still saw like, okay, I'm going to be judged by history here, right? And that was important to me, but I did play with it. And a lot of people, so a huge problem is Citizens United, the fundraising, right? We're becoming an oligarchy in this country. Let's just be clear about that. Um, And so everybody now, if you're a regular person that wants to run for Congress, you've got to raise a ton of money. You can't raise money on optimism. I can't, honestly, if I send out an email that says, I want to fix the road next door, or I want to bring the country together. You're not going to raise money. You will raise money if you say that Nancy Pelosi wants to kill your family. Because listen, no matter how much money you make or don't make, if I convince you that I'm the only thing that can stand between you and literally your family's death, which a lot of people believe, you'll give me anything, including your social security check. And so that's what's happened. People have just gone off the rails because now it's a dopamine addiction right? You do a drug, you got to do more of the drug the next time and the next time. And that drug right now is fear and anger for people. Why do you think so few people like you in the Republican Party, Adam, said no mas? Like, Mm -hmm. what was, was it the dopamine? Was it the addiction to power? Was it saying that, you know, I've got to dance with the one who brought me or whatever it is? I mean, I know you talk about Lindsey Graham in the book. Uh, I know you talk about Ted Cruz in the book. And, you know, I just interviewed the author, McKay Coppins, of a book about Mitt Romney. And I feel like there's so many parallels between you and Mitt Romney. Did you two ever talk about this? No, we we actually text on occasion, but not really about this. Um, It just kind of like real quick text. He's not a big texter, but uh, I am. (laughs) And uh but I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's that it's look everybody in politics, and I'm not saying this to skirt any excuse, but everybody in politics, you got to play with compromise a little bit, right? And you know, you, you're kind of figuring this out. And what happens, and what happened with Donald, is everybody started to say, okay, well, he's the president, I'll accept this, and I'll do that, and eventually. When you turn, if you're going to turn against him, you have to accept the fact that you did things to enable him because by sheer survival, still, you're still there. And it's like the sunken cost thing. So in Vietnam, you know, we lost when when we lost 10,000 men. How come we didn't leave Vietnam? Well, because we already lost 10,000 men. How can we leave now? Right. So we stayed till we lost 50,000. Well, that's the problem is. Once you and Kevin McCarthy is a great example of this. Once you start giving away a piece of your soul, you eventually have to say, "The last seven years, I've been actually a huge sellout." To then turn, and it's just much easier to convince yourself that, "Look, I can't make a difference." I mean, look at Kinzinger and Cheney; they both got sniped. Why would I put my head out? Well, it's true, but when nobody puts their head up, every, the ones that do get sniped. I just want to add, add uh, something to that question um, because. You talk about how you did not vote for Donald in 2016, but you did vote for him in 2020, which is fascinating to me. I know. I'm the only one in America that did that, by the way. But (laughs) in the way you explain it, it makes perfect sense because we're we're hearing now that a lot of senators didn't vote to impeach him because or convict him in the Senate because they they were afraid of retaliation. Uh, And you talk, I I don't think you use this phrase explicitly, but there's a certain level of peer pressure as well. Mm -hmm. And knowing that with somebody like Donald, you're all in or you're all out. There's no, you can agree with him sometimes and disagree with him. So I'm very curious though, why for more people, January 6th wasn't the moment he was out. He lost the election, no matter how much he wanted to lie about it. He incited a, a violent insurrection against his own government, placing you, your staff, and the staff of everybody else in that building, all of your colleagues at risk. People are calling to hang Mike Pence. And um, two days later, three days later, I don't remember what, what it was a very short period of time. I was going to say, Mary, it was the moment for a moment, right? It was (laughs) the final off-ramp and the best and clearest one. What happened? Well, look, so I'll say, you know, on voting the second time for him, I had experienced four years of everybody being like, you never voted for Trump. You know, you're a POS and all this. And I just basically was saying that your constituents or your colleagues, Yeah, the constituents, uh, (laughs) colleagues didn't care. But 
Um, and so you deal with that. And I was just finally like, okay, I'm not going to lie. So I'm like, I'll vote for him. I didn't do it enthusiastically, but I did it. So I didn't have to deal with what I just dealt with for four years. By the mm -hmm. way, that's a macrocosm of exactly why Mike Johnson just won the speakership because there were 25 Republicans that said no to Jim Jordan, which is great, by the way, but they just couldn't do it a second time, right? And so they're like, fine, and they capitulated on that one. But the January 6th, it was weird because in the conference, so when I refer to the conference, just imagine all these Republican congressmen and women meeting, okay? So in the conference, we it was basically dead silent after January 6th. And to give you an example, I was actually considering doing a vote of no confidence against Kevin McCarthy for allowing this to happen. And I actually thought that I might have been able to win it. So that gives you an idea of where the conference was. OK, three weeks later. So everybody's kind of sitting there quiet. We don't know what's going to happen. We're waiting for direction and leadership to say, OK, it's time to move on. Right. There's still the crazy Trump faction, but they were pretty small and quiet at this point. They were I mean, they were loud, but they were small. Kevin McCarthy goes to Mar-a-Lago, gets his picture taken with Donald Trump, and the world turns on a dime. And that is when he took the off-ramp we had, and he drove right past the off-ramp onto the interstate and floored it. And there have been 100,000 different, 100 bajillion different off-ramps we could have taken. But that was the biggest one. And Kevin made the decision because he wanted to be Speaker of the House. He knew he needed to raise money. He knew that if he took on Donald Trump, that there would be a, he, it would, he would be denied enough to become Speaker. And so he decided to fully embrace Trump because once he did that, um, he knew that he, quote unquote, he knew he could bring the rest of everybody else along. It was a selfish decision, decision by Kevin McCarthy that then led to all these lemmings in the Republican Congress following because right. if Kevin's going with him, we can't not. And didn't Lindsey Graham, there were a lot of people who expressed their disgust for that, that tiny window of time. And then you're right. It, everything turned on a dime. And is that why you think so uh, poorly of Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I started to dislike Kevin prior to the election because I noticed that he was defending Donald Trump more than he would defend his majority. So, or his, his people. So, you know, if I said something against, against Donald, he would, and, and I got attacked by him because I'd say that a lot, even during his presidency, Kevin wouldn't defend me. He would defend the former president. And I'm like, well, your job as the minority leader is to defend your people. So that's when that fallout started. And then I also have no respect for people that don't truly have a moral core. You can make compromises for sure. And that's okay to some extent. But when it comes to actual like, like oath type things, um, I lose all respect for you. Look, and this is maybe a controversial way to say it. I don't care. I don't take an oath to the people I represent. Frankly, the people I represent are secondary. The only thing I take an oath to is the Constitution of the United States. And if 700,000 people I represent all want me to violate my oath, I took an oath not to them, to the Constitution. And Kevin McCarthy took that exact same oath. And instead, he made a decision for himself that would change the trajectory of this country. Look, yeah. I can I can say there can be any issue we disagree on, any issue, but we can work through that as long as we agree that the election system is sound. OK, it's why I've even come around on the issue of voting rights, because I've like I'm like, you know what? Republicans are trying to steal elections. I used to like vote against some of the things because I'm like, you know, that's a little hyperbole. There's not going to be a stolen election. Now I'm like I'm not in Congress anymore, so it's easy to say it, but I would vote for voting rights now because I'm like, yeah, actually Republicans are trying to disenfranchise. And and so, but once you take away the faith in the election system, you cannot govern yourself. Like democracy goes out the window. And that's what Donald Trump did by saying the election was stolen. He convinced half the country that the election system doesn't work. And by definition, democracy can't work if you don't have a system that doesn't work. What was it like overseeing those January 6 hearings? I watched most of them. I had a friend who helped produce them. And um, I thought they were so well done and so clearly made the case for what had happened. And yet they didn't move the needle. And I know you write about this, Adam, but yeah. share with uh, share with our listeners why you think that was the case. Well, I first off want to say it didn't move the needle in the GOP. 
Um, but I think there is no way, oh, I don't just think this, I know this, uh, the Department of Justice would not have a case against Donald Trump right now without the January 6th committee. Right. Um, so it was historic in that way. I know that my son, Christian, when he goes to school and learns about this time period, he's not going to hear about the FBI doing this or Antifa. He's going to hear the truth because we got to the bottom of that. So yes, it didn't change people's minds at the moment because they are so vested in being right that they can't admit, right? But their kids are never going to believe the conspiracy theories. And I think within right. 10 years, their parents are going to pretend like they never believed it in the first place. Um, and can I just say something really quick? It's a, This is kind of anecdotal, but I think it it made a huge difference um, it, for the reasons you say, for the education it gave us, and absolutely for what uh, it led the DOJ to do, the evidence that was collected. The One of the most brilliant things about it, too, was that almost, what, 98% of the people testifying were Republicans, mm -hmm. um, which was huge. I think it motivated voters, I think you don't have what happened in 2022 without the January 6th hearing. And it doesn't mean that it convinced Republicans. It means that it motivated the rest of us uh, who were so moved and devastated and uh, proud of what your committee did. Yeah, thank you. And I I'm going to tell you, like, so everybody knows the details of what we did, but I'll share with you a little insight. And I talk about it a little bit in the book, which is just it was like God himself put the right people in that committee because each of us had like a unique skill set that we needed for that moment. Liz Cheney is a dogged, like she's a dog on a bone. She's not going to let go. And she is like, was obsessed with this the whole time. The rest of us had families. She just like lived in the vault learning this information and she could put it together because she's a lawyer and, and a good scholar on that. You know, Benny Thompson, like, it is very rare to find somebody, particularly a chairman of a committee, who is willing to let other people get the spotlight. And he did that with Liz. And we needed that. We needed his calm leadership. You know, Jamie Raskin annoys everybody because they'll tell you how much he knows. But he knows a ton, right? So he brings that. Um, you know, I was paying attention to the right wing conspiracy theories. So I was able to come in and share, like, we have to address the Ray Epps issue. If you don't know the Ray Epps issue, then count yourself blessed. But if you're listening to Fox News or something, they all know Ray Epps. Um, and so everybody brought these unique things. It was a moment that has never happened before. It will never happen again, unfortunately, but it was such a historic moment and we all got along and a really quick, funny quip. I immediately determined to dub Adam, um, Schiff as Adam senior. And I dubbed myself Adam junior because I wanted to make the age joke and it stuck the whole time in the committee. That's funny. <laughs> That's great. I'm sure he I'm sure he really appreciated it. He tried to fight back <laughs> against it a couple of times and then he just went with it. <laughs> so, you know, Kevin McCarthy obviously is pushed out. Jim Jordan doesn't get it. It's just sort of this clown car of potential speakers until finally Mike Johnson gets it. And he's an election denier. Yeah. And um, he's I think worse, you call yeah. him an insurrectionist in a suit. Maybe you is, is that something that you said, Adam? Or Yeah, I said he's Jim Jordan with a jacket. And then I told somebody who said publicly what I said, which is he's Jim Jordan in drag. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you said he's like, also you said he was a well-dressed insurrectionist. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. He uh, so look, every if you look back at the arguments being made uh, to not certify the election by any member of Congress, they all cited Mike Johnson, who was a uh, constitutional, quote unquote, you know, lawyer, and uh, they cite his arguments. He's the one that obviously initiated the amicus brief so members of Congress could sign on to the Texas lawsuit, which is the first thing, the first attempt to throw out these legitimate votes cast by places like Michigan. And uh the, his scary thing is he speaks well, he looks good, he looks like a very polished politician, and uh, he is the chief insurrectionist of the House. He doesn't get the credit that Jim Jordan does because Jim Jordan was louder, but Mike Johnson is the reason that some of these lawsuits and stuff went forward. So, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely worried that he's there. I mean, it's I was just gonna not say good. What does that portend for the House? And, and what do you think, you know, what what? What does that portend for the House and what will it mean in general for legislation? 
Well, I think first off, it means the House isn't going to do much. I think, you know, we've got to get through this government shutdown that's coming up, which I think the government will shut down. Um, but I don't know how long. Inevitably, it has to end. But um, I worry about what it means for aid for uh, Israel and Ukraine, particularly Ukraine. I think they'll get aid for Israel regardless. But Ukraine, to me, is really the fight of our generation right now. Um, now, Mike has, has indicated that, you know, he's open to putting aid on the floor. That's good. I'll give him that. But he's uh, also said, like, maybe it's months away. And the fact that he's going to pay for the Israel aid of $10 billion by cutting the IRS, I'm, it'll be interesting to see how he pays for the $100 billion or $60 billion in aid to Ukraine. And by the way, just a real quick point, most people don't, re don't realize – when you talk about like 60 billion to Ukraine, it's not like taxpayer money. A little bit of that is, a lot of it is old equipment that we were going to destroy, like the ATACMs that we were getting ready to destroy that are being replaced anyway. We send to Ukraine and we have to put a price tag on it. We have to value that. That's what a lot of that money is. Cluster munitions, for instance, we gave Ukraine. In fact, they're very effective. I know they're controversial, but they're very effective for Ukraine's war. Those were all set to be destroyed because we were going to get rid of cluster munitions. But we have to put a value on that. That's just a quick aside that I think people uh, don't know uh, too much on that. It is. Um, I, I wanted to just quickly get your sense of why. It, how we got here in this 100 percent of Republicans in the House. Now, how did this happen in so short a time and why aren't more people taking the road that you and Liz Cheney took? And maybe the simple answer is it's just power, I guess. But yeah, there. And by the way, they're no longer in office. Hello. Right. Right. Well, OK, so that was a stupid question. So let me no, let me no, no. Let me proceed. <laughs> I don't think it was a stupid question because it does address these core values and the ability of people to, you know, to to leave their their moral compass at the door. Yeah, and, I mean, look, yeah. it, it, it became when you started to see anybody that spoke out against Donald being defeated, getting death threats. It only takes a number of those for people to be like, I'm not going to put my head up. Right. There's a yeah. survival thing there. Now, what you see is a lot of people that don't run again. That includes me. And by the way, quick aside, I probably wouldn't have run again anyway because I had been in the House 12 years. That's a long time. And but people don't run again because they're like, I'm just done dealing with it. And I understand it. Like, but in terms of me, you know, like I still consider myself a Republican for only one reason, because I refuse to let them win. Yeah. And I also know that being a Republican gives me a unique ability to go after Republicans, right? Because if I attack a Democrat, everybody's be like, he's a Republican attacking Democrat. If Democrats attack Republicans, like, man, that's just, if you're a Republican attacking Republicans, people pay attention. And and yeah. I haven't changed, you know, I've moderated on a lot of issues, but that's just mm -hmm. with age. Um and so I voted Democratic in 2022. I'll vote Democratic in 2024 because I think there's only one issue on the ballot. And it's do you believe in democracy or not? And because that's all the other stuff we can decide on later. Exactly. And and that's why uh, I want to know a little bit more about what you're doing, because you are one of the very few people who still identifies as a Republican, not a former Republican, not a newly minted independent who who understands that in a deep way, just as in. 2020 and 2022 in 2024 we are voting for democracy or we're voting for autocracy and until we get to the point where democracy is is not just saved one more time but it's actually strong we're never going to be able to get to the point where you and i can start disagreeing about policy again yep so uh how did you come up with uh this plan of yours to uh get just only focus on electing pro-democracy candidates and how's it going? Because I think this is probably the most important work we could be doing right now. Yeah, it's great. And thanks for your work on it too. And I, so my organization is country first, it's country one, the number one st.com. And uh, look, in, in 2012, I had a competitive member against member primary and uh, cause I got redistricted in with another Republican and I actually got a lot of union support. I, I had union support in Illinois. And uh, one of the things I was able to do was get like union Democrats to pull a Republican ballot and vote for me. 
and I won. And so I've, I've been taking that now to the streets, so to speak. So a couple of things we're doing. We have an academy that's teaching people how to run, right? How to actually be a candidate, because that's the, there's a lot of questions on that uh, from people. Republican or Democrat doesn't matter. You just put in the country first. That's the only requirement. And secondarily, uh, the question is like, OK, if you live in a very Republican district, for instance, and you're represented by an insurrectionist and you're a Democrat, you know, yeah, you can vote Democratic in the general election. They're not going to win. So pull a Republican ballot if your state allows it and actually vote for a better Republican, even if you don't like that person, a pro-democracy Republican. That's how we beat Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina. We had 5,000 Democrats that pulled a Republican ballot and he lost by 3,500 votes. So yeah. that's the kind of action we're trying to do. And, you know, I'd love to see, frankly, things like rank choice voting and some and, and real campaign finance reform. That's a kind of tier two target because that's going to take I know a Andrew Yang and Christy Todd Whitman are working on that. Yeah, actually. it's very important. Yep. Yep. And so I think those are some changes we can make. But look, it took us decades to get to this moment. It's going to take us a while to get out of this moment. But we just have to have patience. I want to pick up on that because, you know, you talked about, Adam, in 2028, having sort of a healer come Come. I have two questions about that. One, is the Republican Party salvageable? Could it be morphed into a more reasonable uh, policy oriented, dare I say, moderate, sensible, willing to compromise party? Um, and if so, who are some of the leaders who are up and coming who can replace what's been known, come to be known as the gerontocracy, right? Yeah. Um, how, where do you see happening in the future with all of this? Well, so I see 2028 as going to be a pretty good year for this country because it's going to be all new candidates on both sides. And I think there's going to be a lot of new energy. Uh, I hope it's not Vivek Ramaswamy types. I hope it's just people with good ideas. And so the question of who is going to be the up and coming leader, I don't know, because I don't know if they exist in the political sphere right now. Right. Are there any, is there be... anybody out there who impresses you, Adam? No, honestly. I mean, not in the GOP because Nikki I, Haley. I, 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 nah, you know, look, I, I, I like her to an extent, but she's been, she's been justifying, you know, Donald Trump saying as a two tier justice system, right. It's like, you can't on the one hand be this awesome truth teller and then say that Donald Trump is a victim of a witch hunt. Look at Tim Scott. I'm friends with Tim Scott, but that guy just basically defended Trump and said, Biden has blood on his hands for God's sakes, because of Israel. Like, so I don't know who those people are. I do think the Republican party is salvageable. It will have to be because we have two parties in this country and naturally power flows to where you can get 50% of the people. If the people reject the GOP and reject the extremism in the GOP, it will naturally have to self-correct and it will do that. I do think it's a ways off though. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but it could be accelerated in 2028 if there's a good candidate that I, I say this, we need a, if you're a Republican, your mentor is Ronald Reagan. If you're a Democrat, it's Obama. It's We need that kind of a person, I think, to come along and bring the country together. Could it be you? Uh, you know, look, I'd be open to it. Um, I never thought I'd ever get back into politics, but I also am like looking at this like the itch is coming back a little bit. I'm, I'm careful to say it because I don't want people to think that what I'm doing now isn't anything like because of a plan to run for president because it's not. But I, I wouldn't turn it down. It'd be something I'd certainly be open at looking at. But there, you know, as you just said, there's a leadership vacuum and we need people who represent people who aren't represented by the Democratic Party or whose views are represented by the Democratic Party. Uh, again, the Democratic Party is the only major political party currently who that is pro-democracy party. And we need the Republican Party to be that again. And I think that's that's why what you and Liz Cheney did uh, as Americans, as people who, as you said, made an oath to the Constitution, not to one man, not to your constituents, uh, have sort of paved the way. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see what happens in 2028, but we have to survive 2024 first. And that's, that's going right. to be a 
that's going to be the trick. I don't want to give people hope that 2024 is going to get better. It's going to be really bad, but the hope does come after that. And, uh, and I think, I think it's going to be an American century. I mean, I really do. Um, I think if you just look at all the metrics, our people, everything, it's going to be great, but we go through these times in history. You look at the twenties and there were 2 million Ku Klux. I'm sitting in Chicago right now. There are 2 million Ku Klux Klan members within one state of Chicago all the way around in 1920s. Right. We came back from that. We'll come back. We've been talking. I just want to, I want to sneak in another couple of questions because I thought it was so interesting, Adam, what you said about the Democratic Party and about the potential of it becoming fractured over Israel. Mm -hmm. And you were saying, as someone from a party that has really kind of imploded, you were issuing a bit of a warning to Democrats. And the other thing I wanted to say while we're on the topic of Democrats, yes, they may be pro-democracy, but they certainly are not reaching a lot of these disenchanted, disenfranchised, blue-collar voters that make up the the bulk of, of Trump support. And I'm curious if you could speak to both of those issues. First, well, the Israel one. Well, let me first off say, like, I get concerned with the Democrats because when I tell them this thing, they get offended and get mad at me. And I'm like, look, if you think I'm just throwing a spirit to, to hurt you, I'm not. I'm warning you. And if you don't want to believe it, this is exactly the kind of warnings that were coming from people like Michael Moore in 2016 when he predicted Donald Trump would win and everybody laughed at his face, including me, by the way. Um, so, yes, on Israel, I remember five years ago a guy named um, Dana Rohrbacher, who was the only pro-Russian Republican in the House of Representatives, and I would attack him and attack him in the committee. I got along with him, but I would attack him on these issues, and everybody told me, stop attacking Dana. It's just Dana, right? Now about half of the party is pro-Russia, okay? It grows. In, in this issue with Hamas and Israel— you can be concerned. We're all concerned with Palestinian lives. We're all concerned with that. Okay. But Israel was attacked in a sick and fierce way and they have to destroy Hamas and, and calling for a ceasefire when you don't know the situation on the ground there, by the way, why hasn't Hamas instead of building tunnels, why didn't they build air raid shelters? How come instead of uh, spending money on, you know, guns and weapons, they spent money on civilian infrastructure you know, we all know the answer. And by the way, if Israel was indiscriminately bombing, which if I hear one more time, my head's going to explode, there would be 100,000 dead, not 8,000. So it's terrible. I've been to war. War sucks. OK, but in the Democratic Party, there is a naivete among some that there is a real issue with pro Hamas in the younger generation of left wingers. Um, and I got to tell you, that's a big concern. Uh, fight back now on that and fight back in the college campuses. That's where you so see what it. about if it's not pro Hamas? It is, I think, uh, greater sympathy, which is not really a new phenomenon for the mm -hmm. Palestinians in yeah. liberal circles. And I do think there is not this automatic. I mean, what I've observed, this automatic loyalty to Israel, no matter right. what. And that is sort of a Teutonic shift in a way. And I think we're seeing just a a much different perspective on the whole region, which I think is really important to pay attention to. And I don't yeah. think it's necessarily all pro Hamas, Adam. I, agree. I think it's sort of like, hey, Israeli policies, and you know, I'm probably getting over my skis here, but in certain circumstances, Israelis, po Israeli policy, and of course, it's all a matter of degree and nuance, but that it has been um, really unfair to the Palestinians if you look at the West Bank or if you look some of the policies in Gaza. So I think it's interesting, and and uh, I don't think it's well, necessarily pro Hamas. I get well, I guess I agree. I don't think all of it is pro Hamas, right? But there are some pro Hamas elements, and and oh yes, I, I agree, I agree, yeah. but I not all of them. I agree. And I think the interesting thing, though, is like it, the automatic attack comes to, to Israel on some of these things. By the way, Gaza has a border with Egypt, right? So if you talk about Gaza as an open air prison, well, how come Egypt doesn't let people in? I really think the answer to this is there needs to be an Arab peacekeeping force, but there isn't. Why? Right. And so I, that's just a warning to people. Um, and then what was the other issue, I think? The other question I had is, you know, you talk in your book about sort of 
how coastal elites and the Democratic Party, and this is not a new thing either, but how they dismiss and disrespect people in the middle of the country in the flyover states. Yeah. And and it's it it really is true that they're for whatever reason, the Democratic Party has become a party of elite, college educated, wealthy people. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's actually kind of switched with the GOP on that, by the right. way. Right. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. Look, I think, you know, the voters in my district when I started it, when I started serving was a swing district. It became a very Republican district. And there wasn't a lot of migration in and out of the district. People switched because they felt left behind by the Democrats. And, you know, look, I'm sitting in Chicago right now. I can't tell you in the last two days the number of hardcore Democrats I've spoken to here that are upset about the crime in the city. And now you have this huge migration issue because, uh, you know, there's a lot of like tent cities. They're upset about it. And, uh, uh, that's an issue that Democrats can talk about the compassion. I'm actually very compassionate to immigrants. I'm a moderate on immigration reform, but you've got to listen when you hear those echoes of concern, listen to them and deal with them because otherwise people will feel unheard like they did in the Midwest. And it's why a place like Wisconsin that never should have voted Republican is voting Republican. So it's a war, another, again, another warning. When you hear people being upset about something, don't just tell them they're wrong. Actually, maybe find out if there's something to it. Pay attention. Yeah, that's right. Well, the book is called Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country. Adam, it's a pleasure talking to you. And Mary, this was so fun. Did you get to ask everything, Adam, you wanted to? Yeah, I Did probably have... d- probably not, but you'll just have to come on. Uh, you'll have to come and, on and... Mary's podcast, yeah. Adam. I will. I will. That'd be great. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, this was really fantastic. fun talking to you. Thanks, Adam. And good you luck bet. with the book. And if you announce anything, do it with Mary and me. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank sure. You. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank Take you. Care. He says that to everybody. <laughs> <laughs>